we're uh, hosting this press conference today um, to talk about modelling work that's being done uh, by modellers around Australia, led from the Doherty Institute and University of Melbourne. And just by way of introduction, um, I'm sure you all know that modelling is a really important part of pandemic preparedness. Our modellers, particularly Jodie and James, have been thinking about this for years in the context of flu. It's really important in how it is informing our planning, but it's not, doesn't predict the future. So um, the Doherty, together with many colleagues around Australia, have been working um, really tirelessly since the first reports of this coronavirus outbreak. Uh, to provide modelling to the Commonwealth Government so that we as a nation could be in the best position possible to respond to COVID-19. And um, I personally think that they've done exactly that. Um, so we've got two of our modellers here today, Professor Jodie McVernon. Jodie is the Director of Doherty Epidemiology. She's a public health physician and epidemiologist. She's got extensive experience of working with government on pandemic preparedness particularly focused on influenza. And it's also a great pleasure to have Professor James McCaw. James is Professor of Mathematical Biology and an Infectious Diseases Epidemiologist based at the University of Melbourne. He's an Infectious Diseases Modeler, trained in physics and mathematics, and like Jody, has a really long history of working on pandemic preparedness. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so just to reiterate what Sharon said, the, the work that we've done for government in, in recent months has come from a long experience of planning uh, for pandemic influenza. And so we have a long history of preparedness work uh, in collaboration and consultation with government. And really those models have been repurposed to help to inform the new COVID-19 response plan, which is based on a lot of our thinking about pandemic influenza. Uh, it, Really started a, a process of modelling for preparedness, started with information from Wuhan early in the epidemic. And it was very clear there that this disease was well beyond our experience of influenza pandemic preparedness. What we were seeing in terms of the rate of growth and, and early indicators of severity were really very marked. Um, and based on that, um, we've since seen similar experiences in Europe, uh, in the UK and, and in the US. So it's been terrible to see those epidemics unfold, but also to confirm our early understanding. And when we went up with our models uh, early on, informed by, by dialogue with international colleagues, um, it was very hard to comprehend this, this extent of severity, but our government believed us and has been engaged in, in active preparedness and response for this virus since then. Um, a lot of that early modelling helped to inform early border measures, which were stringent in Australia, much more so than in other parts of the world, and informed our management of repatriated Australians from high-risk settings. Uh, and at that time, some would have criticised the government for overreacting, but, but they believed that this was necessary uh, in, in the face of the challenge that was ahead of us. So the particular piece of evidence that, that has been released today is our repurposed preparedness models that think about the impact of a pandemic on the healthcare system and that um, model thinks about patient flows through the sector. And while a lot of attention has been focused on intensive care requirements, we also think about other parts of the sector that need to be preserved uh, and to be strengthened to be ready for a response. The model is clearly very theoretical, and you've heard that word a lot today. It looks at a theoretical epidemic that occurs uniformly across the country. There's not really much about it that reproduces what we've already seen but the purpose of it is to allow estimate, uh, estimation of the impact of different types of measures um, and to give qualitative understanding of the sorts of things that are going to be needed to control disease spread, even where lots of things remain highly uncertain. And we explore a lot of uncertainty around um, the proportion of cases that need admitting to hospital and other things where evidence is still really emerging internationally. And, and we've based our current models on our best understanding of aggregated information from international settings. It was clear very early that unmitigated epidemics would be well beyond any high income healthcare country's system capacity. So we knew that that was going to be real. And the model informed the critical importance of public health response measures like case isolation and contact tracing, which have been and will continue to be a cornerstone of the Australian public health response. And that capacity has been dramatically expanded in the past couple of months. So our modelling based ex expertise, which is broader than the one model that you've seen today, um, has provided um, perspective and advice on many of the key deliberations um, held um, through government and, and um, we've presented that 
through our advice on um, and membership of the AHPPC. Um, and this is typical of um, most scientific research fields. So in our research field of disease modeling and mathematical epidemiology, um, we draw on multiple sources of information to provide the best advice. And some of that information is the in-house modeling that is being released today. But of course, there's work being done by other scientific groups across Australia, other scientific groups all around the world, and we've been drawing on that to um, help uh, guide our advice to government. Um, so Jody and I are members of both international and, and local working groups. Um, and we've been sharing since mid-January um, our insights um, about this rapidly changing uh, situation, and which is obviously um, highly volatile. Um, and so we have been providing advice um, on other sorts of measures like social distancing, school closures, and all of those things, um, primarily based on extensive reviews of the literature. And then we fold some of that into the models you see today. So where to now, I think is really the key point. And you saw that in the, um, in the uh, Prime Minister and Chief Medical Officers, um, uh, Chief Medical Officers, uh, presentations and press conference today based in part on the work that we've provided and that we've fed into um, based on international experience. And I think we're really in a very lucky position where we can think about the next steps and the very challenging questions ahead, but from a position of relative calm as opposed to crisis, we, we don't have an overwhelmed hospital system yet um, and we may well never have one if we continue to um, base our um, responses on the best available evidence but of course everything there is very uncertain um, so yeah the next few weeks are absolutely crucial we will see inevitably with the increased caseload from the last few weeks inevitably we are going to see um, uh, an increase in hospitalizations admissions to icu and and deaths and I think it's really important at this time to realise that those, that wave of, um, of infections and, and hospitalisations will be driven by the past cases from the last few weeks. And so that increase is inevitable and it doesn't mean that there's a loss of control. Um, that's something that is more nuanced and needs to be worked through um, by analysis of Australian data, um, which is now underway and, and going forward. Um, uh, so I think I will leave it there just to say we're now in this transition from scenario analyses to data science driven situational awareness in Australia.